Hey, welcome back on this episode of the Mindful Money Podcast. I'm chatting with Barbara Freeberg. Barbara has an MBA, is a former portfolio manager and university finance and investing instructor. She currently owns and manages Barbara Freeberg Personal Finance.com and writes for US News and World Report, Investopedia, Forbes Advisor, and many other places. She's a regular panelist on Money Tree Investing Podcast, and she's been part of the FIRE movement. FIRE stands for Finish Independent Retire Early for years. And we were originally connected in 2016 when she wrote a wonderful blurb for my first book. And then she wrote another blurb for my second book. And I just want to say thank you, Barbara, for both of those. Much appreciate it. And Barbara, welcome to the Mindful Money Podcast. Thank you. That was the best intro ever. You sound like you really kind of did your homework. Of course. Don't we all do our homework? No? First, where do you call home and where are you connecting from now? I'm connecting from San Jose. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I've lived about five different places in between. Was one of those the East Coast, New Jersey? My husband's from New Jersey, and I've lived in Pennsylvania. Okay. For some reason, from our first, from our first call, our first conversation, I thought that you were f from the East Coast, but that's not true. Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, if you call Cincinnati East Coast, I guess it's all kind of relative, right? So. Growing up in Cincinnati, like, what did you learn about money and entrepreneurship? Both my parents were depression babies, so that was their ethos. They lived, my father actually lived in poverty. His father was out of work for seven years during the Depression. His mother sold notions on the street with a cart. So my father started working, selling newspapers on the corner at age 10. So, and my mother had a, a middle-class type of a life. So I learned everything about money from my parents. They weren't afraid to talk about it. They were both entrepreneurial and they were both very, very good with money. Wow. That's kind of a lucky start. I mean to have the uh, open conversation around money. I think when I talk to a lot of peers, I'm wondering if that's what drove you into the industry. I think so. You know, as a teen, it was like, why do you always talk about money? What's so important? Money doesn't matter. Well, <laughs> come to find out, it kind of does. And after trying out a lot of majors in college, I settled on an economics major because it introduced you to so many concepts within the world. And then from there, I incorporated, really, my dad loved the stock market and he really liked investing and he kind of planted that bug in me. And so that's kind of how it started. So do you remember like a specific experience, you know, as a kid that develops into one element of your money story? Yeah, my dad started a real estate company the year that I was born. And that might be called kind of a fix and flipper. You know, today, what he did was build, buy a lot of very low cost houses in disrepair. He fixed them up and then he resold them. And additionally, he was a broker. So he had a litany of sales people working for him, including my mom. So our Sundays were usually spent piling into the car and driving around and looking at real estate. So what do you learn about? How do you carry that into beliefs about money? What do you learn about that as a kid? Well, you learn to look for value. Oh. And so that is the driving principle within my life. In my real estate, I've invested in real estate. I have invested in individual stocks, funds. And I live my life with a value orientation, looking to pay less than something is worth. Nice. That's... And I think it serves, has served me really well because living underneath your means most of the time really helps you <laughs> when times are tough. For sure. So before we dig into Barbara Freeberg, personalfinance.com, what did you do that led you to the FIRE movement? I mean, we talked about you know, university teacher about, you know, finance, but also just portfolio management. How did you get from that to fire movement or to blogging? How I began blogging is an insane story because 
I had got my MBA later in life. And my next goal was I'm going to write a book about this. Who knew? You know, I thought piece of cake sent out a bunch of prospectus, prospecti, prospectuses, and kept getting back. You know, you need a following. So today, as I'm sure you know, publishers don't want to do the work for you. They want you to do the work yourself and bring together an audience. So one of my colleagues said, we'll start a blog. You'll build up an audience. So I started Barbara Freeper Personal Finance in 2010. And subsequently, I ended up with a book contract called Encyclopedia of Money Management and edited a huge encyclopedia of money management that is still in print today, albeit a little bit dated. And then I wrote a couple other books as well. But starting that blog started, introduced me to the world of online publishing. And it just kind of grew from there. So, you know, the reason I wanted to have you on was to talk about the financial content business. I heard it from you. And that's, since we spoke at that lunch a while ago, I've, ta- I've heard it from many others like that. They're not having the impact that they want to have. It's frustrating to run a, a website or a blog or a podcast. They're not reaching the people they really wanted to reach. So where do you think all this frustration comes from? Why is it such a difficult road? I am so glad you asked me this. I have never talked about it online. And let me just say, over the, well, now it's 2023. So over the 13 years since I started my Barbara Freeberg personal finance blog, I also started in 2015 RoboAdvisor Pros with an idea to review RoboAdvisors and provide unique content and reviews and monetize that through affiliate links. And for those of you who don't know, an affiliate partnership is a contract between a publisher and a brand. Whereas if you drive traffic to that publisher, then they will pay you a commission. And so it's a really brilliant model. And that was the website where I really developed a lot of the income for that website through the affiliate model initially. And Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance, I developed some monetization through sponsored posts where people will pay you to include a link to their product or service or to review their service. I garnered a bit of advertising income, and I ultimately became a freelance financial journalist, which is relatively lucrative. Is it? And Yes, it is. And I say relatively because... You know, it's not being a software engineer, but it is also better than working at Wendy's. Not that there's anything wrong with working at Wendy's. I love Wendy's. And I'm telling you all this to give you an idea about the ways to make money with a blog or a website. But there's a dirty truth underneath, and this is what you were getting, Yeah, which is especially in the finance space and in any space online that is lucrative, little guy or gal will eventually be competing with the biggest brands. In finance, those biggest brands happen to be Investopedia, Nerd Wallet, Forbes Advisor, U.S. News and World Report. Now, I kind of dip into both ends because I write for those publications. But I saw my affiliate income. I had one post and I had one month with affiliate income, which was the absolute peak for predominantly my RoboAdvisor Pros website because Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance to this day makes a minimal, minimal amount of money. 14 years Mm. I had one month 
where I made maybe $6,000, which I thought was freaking amazing. And I thought I was on the path. But because the money is so lucrative and the big brands get in, all of a sudden, the ranking on my most lucrative article went from number one to number two to number 10, and the money just dried up. Because NerdWallet and because Forbes Advisor were starting to write the same titled articles and they would... Investopedia. Investopedia. So there, if I write a Betterment review, which is a well, you know, a well-regarded robo-advisor, and there's only three or four of, of those reviews out there, I'm going to rank, I'm going to get conversions, I'm going to get people to sign up, and I'm going to make money. Right. But then when Bankrate, Motley Fool, yeah. Forbes Advisor, Business Wire, 10, 20 big brands write that same review, I'm done. So when you originally started with Barbara Friedberg, personalfinance.com, what was the goal? What were you hoping to accomplish with it? The goal was to get a book contract. I knew nothing about making money with a blog. That all came later and in community and collaboration with other online bloggers, website owners, I learned, wow, People are actually making money with this. I can do this too. And my eyes lit up and I was like, I can create a real job where I'm making a lot of money from my blog. And that hasn't turned out to be the case. I'm just curious. So you must have read Making Sense of Sense. Of course. Yeah. yeah she has an amazing, ama she's one of, I would say the one of a handful of nerd wallet. The owner of that website started the same time I did. Wow. He started with a blog. Clearly, he succeeded. Right, right. And it's not, I mean, the story you're telling is if you're not in that top three or four category, you're just, you get scraps if that. Yeah. I mean, that's been my experience. That has been the experience with many other people I've talked about, with people I hear and meet on, you know, online. And there's a draw, though, to keep trying. And I, I still put out contract content on Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance, even though it is not the return on my time investment is bad. Yeah, not good. Okay, I'll just say it. It's bad. Yeah. I'm in a position now, having done the, all the smart money habits, where everything I do doesn't have to be about money. Right. And when I get a an email from a reader who says, you know, you really helped me, that's gratifying to me. So, I mean, that's the reality is the, the impact is not, the impact you want to make is on the benefit for other people. And because frankly, this information, it's out there, it's available, but people don't get it. People don't engage it. People don't learn about it. So what do you think about all of the more nefarious course creators, financial influencers, you know, money education people that are on TikTok and on, they're just telling people things that they want to hear because there's a lot of that stuff out there and you end up competing with them. So how do you deal with that? That's a really good question because there are some people that are very charismatic. I've seen some awesome TikTok videos and some amazing YouTube videos and People with a lot of followers that don't really have the type of credentials, I would say, to be trusted. And their information may not be credible. I happen to have an MBA. I have decades of investing experience. I've taught at the university level. So you know what I say. And I write for the top financial publications in the U.S., so it's likely that what I'm going to say can be believed. And I say this not to toot my horn. Well, you know, maybe a little, but not so much. But I say this because whenever you're listening to someone or whenever you're following them, look at their credentials. You have credentials to be a financial planner. You had to go to school for that. 
You had to pass tests for that. You are licensed. Look at who you're listening to. Just look at them on LinkedIn. Super easy. If they are a financial advisor, look them up on broker check, and that will discuss all the disciplinary actions. And I would recommend to anyone, whomever you're listening to, make sure you know what their background is so that you can assess the level of accuracy of their information and also understand how they are getting paid. Every single article that I have on my website where I have an affiliate link is clearly stated. Whenever I do a YouTube video, and I include an affiliate link where I would get paid if you signed up for one of the robo-advisors or financial products that I'm discussing. I have a disclosure, so you understand that, that I have, even though I try my hardest to be totally unbiased, you understand that I might be getting a commission if you sign up for something I'm discussing. So do you think, I mean, just given the volume of just garbage that's out there, eh, some of it's good stuff, but some of it's garbage. Do you think the smart messages get drowned out? Because I, and I'll just be very direct here. I look at myself on camera on a YouTube video. I'm nowhere near as charismatic or as attractive as some of these other people that I'm watching their YouTube videos and there. And it just doesn't look as good. I don't have the production quality. I don't have the, but the message is good. So it's, the question is, you know, how do you attract an audience to teach? knowing that there's so many people out there that don't really know what they're saying, but they're better at the video production or they're better at that, or they've got more money to fund a, a better video production or what have you. So how do you pick as a consumer, how do you pick who you listen to? And do you have some people that you listen to that you think are worthy of listening to? Sure. Of course. I mean, on my podcast, I don't listen to a huge amount of podcasts, but I listen to Schwab has some great podcasts. Morningstar has some very superb podcasts. Those are reputable brands with high quality people. I listen to your podcast. I listen to Cambria. I can't think of the guy's name. What is his name? He's the head of Cambrian Funds. And really smart guy. He has a bunch of ETFs out. I listen to his podcast. I don't listen to anyone's financial podcast who does not have credentials and degrees in the and experience in the financial realm. There is no value in that to me. So I want to shift a little bit. I want to talk about investing. So should individuals be picking stocks? Or should they just buy broadly diversified ETFs or no-load funds? I love this question. I met a young woman, 43, last week at a community event. And she asked me what I did. And I told her. And she said, investing. Oh, my gosh. I've just lost so much money picking individual stocks. You have to help me. And I got together with her for lunch last week. And this is one of the absolute most funnest things I do because I can help you. The research is very clear that individuals who invest in actively managed mutual funds, which means there's a portfolio manager who's hopefully very smart at the helm, underperform those who invest in what we call unmanaged index funds, they underperform 70 to 80% of the time. So if you can extrapolate that just a bit, Jonathan, what we're saying is, and you and I have already had this conversation, I'm sure your listeners have heard this answer, that even if you actively pick stocks, or you invest with an active manager who is picking stocks, and you have an amazing year, the likelihood that that manager or yourself will outperform a plain vanilla index fund, S&P 500, VT, which is the Vanguard Total World, 
index fund year over year is really, really unlikely. It's just very unlikely. I learned, I was a stock picker when I was a portfolio manager and I was pretty good. I was a value investor as, as is my approach, but I learned there is an abundance of research that shows that long-term investors will come out ahead if they stick with a very simple index fund investment portfolio. Yeah. Boom. Drop the mic. That's absolutely. And I would just go a little bit further and say that the longer that people focus their efforts on active management or picking stocks, the longer that they do that, the lower the probability that they outperform. So you could have a great year. You can have a great three years, but no one's going to have a great five years or 10 years or 20 years. It's not going to happen. So yeah, broad, diversified ETFs, no load funds, non-managed. That's uh, the way to go. Actually, I just updated a, well, we'll put this at the end, but it's something free for you guys. So put it in there now. It's pretty much a synopsis of the low fee index fund investing strategy. It's a micro book. I give it away for free. If you sign up for my newsletter, that's the payoff for me. I get you on my newsletter, which of course you can unsubscribe to whenever you want. So no pressure, but we'll put it in the show notes. And if you want to sign up and get this, how to grow your wealth through investing, it's 30 pages, basic stuff. It's all yours. It's current as of last week. Awesome. I look, we'll put that in the show notes for sure. So you were actually really early on in the robo-advisor commentary. You mentioned that you know, that was the most successful month you had was because of that article or that website, actually. So yes. what do you think about, I mean, I always looked at robo-advisors as an answer in search of a question. Like we already had Vanguard's, you know, blended portfolios that had all the different pieces in it. We already had, Morningstar already had ETFs and all this stuff existed with balanced portfolios, 60-40 portfolios, growth portfolios, it already existed. So these robo-advisors come out, they don't invent something, they just charge an additional fee for it. So how do you, what do you think about robo-advisors in the space of existing products like Vanguard that has already blended funds that have all the stuff in there? Robo-advisors are not homogenous and they cover the spectrum from free, no management fee. And of course there are ways they make money through maybe like Schwab, Intelligent Investor which I am invested in for my workplace retirement account, full disclosure. They have, I have 20 differentiated ETFs within my portfolio according to my risk tolerance. But I am required or they craft my portfolio with 8 to 10% cash. Now the cash is in a high yield account. It's a treasury account. So I'm getting, you know, probably 4%. That's fine for me. I don't care. I'm cheap. I don't want to pay a management fee. And I like them doing the work. I'm in line with their strategy. There are a handful of other fee-free robo-advisors. And then you get the Betterment and Wealthfront and a whole cadre that charge 0.25% of the assets you have managed. So... If you have like a tiny, tiny amount, yeah. I'm not going to do the math because I'm going to put the decimal point in the wrong place, you know, but what is 0.25% of $10,000? What is it like $2 and 50 cents? Yeah. I think. Yep. So, you know, if you have $10,000 and you're paying $2 and 50 cents a year, that's affordable. And what you will get from the average robo-advisor is you will get a very well-diversified investment portfolio. I have yet to see a robo-advisor whose portfolio I don't think is any good. Right. They all employ or they all include very low-fee exchange-traded funds. So you get, for a very low fee, a very nicely managed portfolio. Yeah. When the portfolio gets out of whack with the asset allocation, which means the percentages that you want because of 
your risk tolerance level, they rebalance it for you. And then many of them have other bells and whistles. Betterment offers low fee financial planning packages. Wealthfront, who I happen to really like these days, is all digital. But if you want to tweak your portfolio, you really love tech or robots or something like that, you can throw an ETF like that into the mix and they'll rebalance it. And then they have lending. So they offer low fee margin loans, which, you know, of course you can get it, you know, Fidelity, Schwab, anywhere else. Fidelity Go has a nice robo advisor that is actually fee free up to, I think it's either twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars. And then there are tons of other iterations, some with financial advisors, some many that are part of large investment brokerage houses. There are even some actively managed robo advisors. So even though I sold my website, I still like the concept. It is for the person that doesn't even want to go to Vanguard and figure out what to invest in. So the idea is they have a questionnaire. They ask you 10, 12 questions that, you know, help you set your own risk tolerance. Less, five questions, less, six, most, and then that yeah. builds your portfolio. And then you don't have to think about it yourself. You don't have to do a thing ever. So, I mean, it brings up a question though, and that's if I wake up on a Monday and I had a great weekend. Like it was a great weekend. Had a good time. Went out in the bay with some friends. You know, just had a blast, right? Had a great weekend. And then someone says on Monday to answer these five questions and those five questions, you know, end up with my portfolio. I answer those five questions differently than if I have a Monday like yesterday or two days ago when I woke up and I was, I kind of had a cold and I didn't feel good about things. And I, the last weekend was pretty rough and something happened. So when do we second guess ourselves when we answer those questions? That's a really good question because we all know that our opinions are influenced by our feelings, by how we feel at the time. You're going to answer a question differently if you're feeling happy and up and confident and optimistic. Or maybe the market just, you know, the last year hit 30%. Or close to 30%, like I think was the case maybe around 2021. And you may say, hey, I can handle a lot of risk. My risk tolerance is to the moon. And so then you get an investment portfolio that's 80% stocks and 20% bonds. And then the next year, 2022, the stock portion of your portfolio drops 20 plus percent. And you're like, what the heck? I can't handle this. I'm selling. And that's the risk. You never, ever want to have money in the stock market that you need within the next five years. Because if you are forced to sell at the bottom, you have set yourself up to not know when to get back in and you will ultimately lose the rebound. Right. That's the whole. Uh... So, yeah, the benefit of the robo advisor is. You can change your asset allocation. So you can change it whenever you want. So you and I talked about this too. And you're very risk tolerant, but you're also very knowledgeable. And if you've got someone who's, say, 30 and thought they were really risk tolerant and finds out they're not, first of all, being in a robo-advisor puts a barrier kind of against selling. You may be less apt to sell than if you're after a loss than you would be if you were managing your portfolio yourself. But also you might call up the rep or you might read some articles and you might say, you know, I think I'm going to change my asset allocation a little bit and I'm going to go down from, you know, 80 or 90% stocks to 70%. And you can do that from the, the, you know, from, for going forward. In the robo-advisor, yeah. In the robo-advisor, yeah. So you can make changes whenever you want. I mean, and you do the same thing in your own portfolio. I manage my own portfolio. And there are days I look at my asset allocation and I said, what, 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 what was I thinking? <laughs> this is horrible. You know, my REIT has gone to, to crap. 
And my international funds haven't moved in decades, you know. But I have enough knowledge and information to know that trends manifest themselves in really long, long, long times. And so patience is a really important part of investing. Probably, you know, in my opinion, the most important part. This is why that mindfulness becomes so important because however you begin, whatever portfolio you choose, some piece of that portfolio is going to be awful. Otherwise, it's just simply not diversified. Like that, if you're actually diversified, it won't all work. That's the whole point of being diversified, right? Is it's not all going to work. And so, but those things trade. Like now this isn't going to work. And then next month or week or year, this won't work. Like it, we don't know what's going to work next. We just know that broad diversification works over time. When or what situations do you think call for an actual advisor? We've talked about picking your own stocks or picking your own ETFs. We've talked about you know, robo-advisor, not robo-advisor, but are there situations where, yeah, this makes a lot of sense, you should have an advisor? Yes, absolutely. And I believe in financial advisors. Many people just don't have the interest to learn enough about investing to make those types of decisions. And if you're one of those people, I don't care what your financial situation is, you may want to at least have one or two meetings with an advisor. And then there are wealthier individuals who have more complex situations, and they definitely need an advisor because they need somebody to talk their tax situation, their estate planning, and all that stuff. And they need help, or else they need to craft their own team of lawyers and accountants to advise them on the issues. That I mean, that's what I do. I actually have met with an advisor to talk about some tax issues, I have an accountant who can help me with the tax issues. I have an estate planning attorney who can help me with estate planning. And so there is definitely room for professionals. But I have to say, and I know you agree with me, you have to use a professional who is a fiduciary, which means they put your interests before their own. And that someone who is very clear on how they are getting compensated, you need to understand that and agree with that. There are fee-only financial planners, which may be appropriate for some people. Commission-paid financial advisors can be appropriate for others. If you only trade once in a while and you don't want to pay, you know, 0.75 or 1% of your assets for men. But again, they have to be a fight fiduciary. Right. Definitely fiduciary regardless, right? So there's, there's a ton of noise out there because I know your expertise is investing. Can you simplify investing for the audience? Like what is one thing that people can do today that would lead to better lifetime investing success? If you have a workplace retirement account, invest up to the point that you get the employer's match. That is the bare minimum you should be doing. Huh. It is optimal to invest the most you can, you are allowed under law. And that will get you a very good start on your investing. And in your investments, you want to pick either low fee index funds or a target date fund, which is focused on your retirement date. Oh, we could get into that whole target date thing, but we won't. I know we won't there today. are, you know, I, there I are hate pros target and dates. Cons. I hate them. Yeah, I know. We talked about that too, <laughs> but you know, okay. No, but I, I, I get it. You want for our low fee equity exposure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and if you don't have a workplace retirement account, then you need a Roth IRA. Ah, oh, fair. So. That's one thing people should do. What's one thing they should stop doing? Get off your phone stock app. Put that away. You don't need that. If you can't help yourself, then make sure that you are not investing any money, any more than 5% of your total investable asset in your own stock trading. You're not going to be a successful day trader. Trust me. Wow. That's direct. I really appreciate it. That's so awesome. We have to remember that these apps are designed to pull us in. And I 
literally last week I took X, Twitter, whatever off of all of my platforms because it just sucks me in and I get, I just get pulled in by it and I just get, you know, an hour later I look up and I'm like, oh my God, what? I just blew an hour. So I just took it all off. I do the same thing with your Robinhood or whatever That's trading tough. app you have. I, do- I definitely support yeah. that. I support that. And I have to share a little story. I have the Duolingo app and I, I was fluent in Spanish many decades ago and have, have lost something. So over the past year, I've been working to gain my fluency back. And it is gamified, which means if I miss a day or if I'm late in my practice, then I get a message. And they are contacting me all day. And if I don't do well enough, then I get dropped from the league. And I have to tell you, I cannot miss a day and I cannot get dropped. Now, this gamification really, does it really matter? No. If I get dropped, so what? If I don't keep up my 200-day streak, so what? It's not money. But these other things have financial consequences. Day trading has financial consequences that can be severe. Same with Bitcoin. Don't put all of your investments in cryptocurrency. Wow. Thank you. Just a couple like last minute things here. Is there anything people don't know about you that you really want them to know? Not really. (laughs) No. No. I mean, everything I want them to know, I put out there and the other stuff I really don't want them to know about. Oh, nice. Well said. Well said. I mean, maybe that I like to play pickleball and ping pong. Okay, so I don't really talk about that much. Pickleball. I don't think anybody cares. But Oh, everyone plays pickleball now. Everyone cares. Everyone plays it. It's like the new thing. <laughs> so if you could get the truth about one question in your life, I can't give you the answer, but if you could get the truth about one question, what would the question be? What would you ask? When am I going to die? Really? All this planning is like, come on, just give me the end date so I can know how much I can spend today. Oh. This machinations, like I might have 10 years. Oh my God, someone my age just died. Maybe I only have a week. You know, just give me, maybe a range would be good. Like a five-year range. All right. That would simplify planning for sure. For sure, that would simplify planning. Yeah, can you help me with that? I can't give you the answer. I just want to know what the question is for everyone else. Yeah. So what do other people say for their question? Actually, that's the most answered is like, when am I going to die? But then pe- most people say, I don't want to, there's nothing I want to know that way. Many people say, no, I don't want to, I don't have any major question that I want the answer to because it'll change how I just go through life. Like if I know that it'll change what I do. I'd rather just have the freedom to do whatever I want to do instead. Yeah. And what about you? Is that, what's your answer? Huh? No one's ever turned that one back on me. So let's see here. But now that you have, I have to, I've got to answer this question. The only thing I really care about right now, I've got two kids, one 18, one, sorry, one 19, one 16. I just want to know that they're going to be okay. Like, I just want to know that they're, they are going to become solid citizens of the real world. Like, you know, be happy, be well-adjusted. I want to know that I've done the best I could by them. That's pretty much, that's my only concern in life. Then my wife would tell you the same thing. That's all we care about. <laughs> Make sure they're launched. Absolutely. Right? There's really nothing more. That's right. Really. That's right. Once you have them, it's everything. It is. Ever- You're absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. So tell us or tell people how they can connect with you. Where do they find you? You can connect with me on my website at Barbara Freeberg Personal Finance. I have a contact form. And I love to hear from people with investment questions. And I love to just know what people are thinking and give the guidance that I can. I am not a licensed financial advisor. I'm not looking for clients. In fact, I have no clients because I'm not a licensed financial advisor. So, and then you can just Google me and all the stuff pops up. That's great. Barbara, thanks for coming on. We'll make sure everything's in the show notes. I think I still need that link to that document that you mentioned earlier. You will get it. Thanks, Barbara. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jonathan.